Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our closing plenary session. It is my honor to uh, moderate this closing plenary session. And in just a moment, I will be introducing our distinguished panel. But first, we are very fortunate this evening to have the President of the Dominican Republic kick things off for us. Please give us a warm welcome to President Leonel Fernandez. Well, thank you, Maria, for your presentation and to all the distinguished panelists. But uh, since this is a Latin American a chapter of the World Economic Forum, I think I will be more at ease if I address you in Spanish, if you allow me. I know that there will be a simultaneous translation here today. Bueno, decía que como efectivamente esta es la versión latinoamericana del Foro Económico Mundial, creo que es más apropiado que pueda dialogar con ustedes en español. Y naturalmente, aunque lo haré muy brevemente, trataré de compartir con ustedes nuestra perspectiva acerca de hacia dónde va América Latina en las próximas décadas, pero tomo como punto de partida lo que ha ocurrido en los últimos años. Y por supuesto, América Latina post Segunda Guerra Mundial emprendió un modelo de desarrollo que todos hemos identificado como desarrollo. Industrialization through import substitution and represented a process of urban development amongst our peoples. In the specific case of the Dominican Republic, 50 years ago, our population was 70% rural and 30% urban. And today it's the opposite. Now we have a population which is uh, primarily urban. And obviously, this has made an extraordinary impact in demographic terms and social and economic terms. And what has happened in the Dominican Republic is the same, the same as occurred in the rest of Latin America, and the industrialization model and urbanization model. And we could say that it was actually successful since 1945 until the 1970s, when there was a depletion and exhaustion of this model, rather than we're having the state as the central thrust of promotion of the development and growth. We have a different model which was shaped, was shaped in the 1980s and which was consolidated in the 1990s, which is that where the em main emphasis is on the market. And I should say that when we moved and introduced the new model or the philosophy of the uh, primary role of the model, there were two effects. There was a correction element regarding what was called the populism macroeconomy, and it was positive in the sense that it stabilized the, the macroeconomy of our people. So we had monetary policies and fiscal policies in coordination. In, in addition, we could undertake levels of economic growth that we had lost during the 1980s, known by everyone as the lost decade, the 1980s. Fine. This new emphasis on an economic development model, which is based on the market, only had one serious effect. It was the fact that we did not cover the application of social policies oriented towards reduction of poverty and social equality and uh, the equality in general. And the emphasis was placed on achieving stability of macroeconomic indicators and growth and it lost the perspective of a social policy. And we realized that the problems in the Latin America that we've had in recent years is because of the lack of a social justice policy. But in a general sense, we could realize that in the region, Latin America, there was progress and growth and stability, and especially with the transition towards democracy, which occurred beginning in the 1980s. When you take all the indicators, and life expectancy, for example, indicators concerning infant mortality, maternal mortality, all of the social indicators which years ago, and if you compare them today in Latin America, we've seen huge progress in that sense. But still, with these deficiencies and gaps which uh, we've seen in their totality. So looking forward now, what we understand as Latin America, which it requires and demands, is an integral, comprehensive development model with economic aspects, social aspects, political, institutional aspects, 
environmental issues, cultural aspects, scientific aspects, technological aspects, and that of competitiveness as well. All of this in a comprehensive process. In this process, the entire world, in Latin America, we have been impacted by a major event, the crisis, financial global crisis that occurred in 2008, and especially in combination with that, prior to that, and jointly with uh, it was the crisis in the prices of fuels, the oil crisis and crisis of food prices, which was slightly before the fi global financial crisis and to, that disappeared when the financial crisis uh, took the front pages and it reappeared again precisely in the year 2011, in the late 2010, early 2011, when economic recovery occurred, not only uh, they re-emerged the issue of inflation with the price hikes and the fuels and foodstuffs. So we in Latin America, as the result of the impact of the f global financial crisis, it became an economic crisis. First of all, for us, it was not a financial crisis for us. In some countries, what, there was an international trade crisis, and this international trade crisis for us it became a problem here in Latin America and some countries for public finances because the fiscal revenue dropped due to the fact that there were fewer imports and it led to less tariffs and the reduction of tariff revenue and there was a drop in exports as well as a result of a decrease in the demand in the international markets. Hence. For the developed world, what was a financial crisis, and for some countries in Latin America, in the case of the Dominican Republic, it was a trade crisis which became a fiscal crisis or a decrease in our fiscal revenue and resources. What was the reaction, international reaction, to solve the issue of this crisis? At the in the first stage, there apparently was a reaction, a uniform reaction, in the sense that and of creating programs for fiscal stimulus for overcoming the crisis, especially to solve the problem of the lack of credit for institutions and the markets. But over time, the, after establishing these fiscal policies for fiscal stimulus, pro-cyclical Keynesian type policies, we saw a reaction in the opposite direction. Rather than intending to escape the crisis on, based on injecting resources, they attempted to apply austerity policies because they had observed that the first reaction to for this fiscal solution to the financial crisis had increased the problem of the public debt. Hence, they developed, based on the Pittsburgh meeting, the G20, two different the European and the North American views. The European view prioritized the issue of the debt, therefore applying austerity policies and the United States policy in the sense that the crisis could only be overcome with a greater injection of resources and to increase the growth and to the extent that the economy would grow, they would decrease the debt as compared to the GDP. And we saw that based on the Pittsburgh and after the Pittsburgh meeting and Seoul and Seoul rather the differences in the major power poles of how to deal with the issue of the global financial crisis. What about these differences of opinions in our countries? How did they play out here? We can see in the way that the IMF acted, the countries that had agreements with the IMF at the time of the global financial crisis received the orientation and of applying fiscal stimulus policies, therefore expansion of public spending. But soon, influenced by the concept in Europe that was the opposite, uh, cuts in spending and adjustment in order to control the public deficit or the public debt. Hence, there was, in this sense, let's say, opposite positions which had not contributed to the definitive solution to the problem of the global financial crisis. We observed that the European thesis gained ground and it, in the debate that occurred in the United States now the President Barack Obama has cut the budget for 2011 by $38 million billion because they understand that the three, $13 trillion that represent currently the public debt in the United States uh, makes unsustainable in the medium and long term to achieve recovery and to achieve sustainability. 
Therefore, currently we are now in the debate, international debate, of how to solve the problem of the financial crisis, the crisis, but allow me, I don't know if I have enough time. Okay. In the specific case of us in Latin America, I believe that, and this is in the case of the Dominican Republic, we got back to 2004 to the government in the middle of a financial crisis, a local financial crisis. The GDP in the Dominican Republic in the year 2004 was $20 billion. In other words, $20 billion, it says. Again, seven years later, the Dominican GDP was equivalent to $53 billion. So in the midst of a global financial crisis, even overcoming the local financial crisis with the combination of the two crises, with the oil crisis in 2007, 2008, plus despite all this, the Dominican Republic more than doubled its GDP. This leads us to think that looking towards the future, the Dominican Republic and Latin America as a whole have a, a bright future. We have a bright future. We believe that our economies will continue to grow that the GDP will continue to grow in our economies. It's a very simple reason. In the case of South America, there's an abundance of natural resources, especially energy resources, which increase the, well, the demand is increasing, especially in China and India. The economies, the emerging economies will, will demand uh, more energy resources that Latin America will supply. In this sense, we see Brazil playing a huge leadership role, especially because of the new oil reserves that are found here in Brazil in the pre-salt area, for example, where they've already announced investments of $150 billion for extracting oil at deep, ultra-deep offshore reserves. This will increase the world's oil reserves and the capacity for the supply that Brazil has and consequently its economic strengthening in the future and a leadership role, an increasing leadership role. The thing, same thing with Venezuela with its oil, but in the specific case of the Central American Caribbean countries, a greater integration with the North American economy through Maquilas and through the uh, industrial uh, free zones. What we see is the need to make a, a transition from textiles and, so to speak, plastics and medical equipment towards goods and services with greater added value. We would view in the case of high technologies, information, communications technologies, ICT, software industry, in our case, in Spanish language, but in the common financial language, uh, software programs in biotechnology, health sciences, developing products and services that will allow us to have greater connectivity with the U.S. economy where 80 percent of the exports, uh, Central American Caribbean exports go to the United States. Consequently, I don't want to overdo and go beyond my time limit. What I mean to say that even living in the midst of difficult circumstances, in the midst of a situation of financial turbulence and economic turbulence in the world, Latin America has continued to grow and has continued to be, be stable. Therefore, looking forward, the issue is to first see how to consolidate a democratic state of law, rule of law, more transparent, more accountable, more accessible, more streamlined, more efficient. The people have this state democratic and social rule of law together with national strategies for development which take into consideration in turn strategies for competitiveness and how to improve their productivity and inclusion in the international markets. Hence, I, am, I completely agree with some forecasts which certain financial institutions have made that looking in the long term, Latin America will continue to be, be on a path of growth for sustainable growth and development, prosperity and well-being. That's why it will require political leadership which is committed, truly committed to these values. And I don't want to go uh, tired further, so thank you very much for your attention and your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for those important insights, particularly looking at the template of the Dominican Republic as we continue to try to better understand the entire region and hope to achieve the 2020 goals for Latin America. So today we are talking about those goals, goals of growth across the region, continued rising fortunes of the people, and opening markets and new opportunities across the region. 
we will discuss that, but we will also look at it through sub-themes. So those sub-themes today are growth targets for innovative development, social prosperity. We will talk about social programs, what is needed, required, and achievable, security and political stability, interregional relations, and global influence. So let me introduce our wonderful panel today as they attack each of these sub-themes. We're hoping uh, after we hear a bit from each of our panelists, we can open it up to questions and be as interactive as possible. So do plan to participate, all of you. On my left is Federico Fleury Corrado, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Embraer of Brazil, also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum on Latin America. Next to him is uh, Federico, uh, next to him is, I'm sorry, Bruno Ferrari Garcia de Alba is the Secretary of the Economy of Mexico. My apologies, uh, Bruno. Next to Bruno is Federico Flori Corrado. Uh, after Federico is Orit Gadesh, Chairman of Bain and Company USA, member of the Foundation Board of the World Economic Forum and one of the co-chairs of the World Economic Forum on Latin America. Luis Moreno is president of the Inter-American Development Bank, Washington, D.C., and co-chair of the Forum on Latin America. Vikram Pandit is chief executive officer of City USA, co-chair of the World Economic Forum. Sir Martin Sorrell is chief executive officer of the WPP Group, United Kingdom, and also co-chair of the World Economic Forum on Latin America. So we talk about these growth uh, potential issues. And Bruno Ferrari, let me start with you as you look toward interregional trade and global influence. Thank you, Maria. The first thing that I would like to say on that is that uh, uh, just thinking in, the, in this new situation of Latin America, I have to say that uh, when Mexico began with the first free trade agreement that we made, uh, there were 40 free trade agreements on the world. And nowadays, we have more than 280 which means that there is a lot of erosion on, on the different activities that has been done on this area around the world. So you need to challenge more what is what you are doing. On that case, uh, we do believe that for the case of Latin America, we need to integrate more ourselves than ever. For instance, if you think in the European Union, uh, there you have that uh, more than 75% of the goods and services that they consume are being produced in the European Union which is not the case for Latin America. In our case, we don't have even the 20% of those goods that we consume. So we need to enhance the relationship between ourselves. Because nowadays, with this erosion, what we need to think is more in regional terms, not just free trade agreements between two countries or three. We need to think more in a regional basis. That's why we are looking with a lot of interest, for instance, the Pacific Arch, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when, you are, when you are thinking uh, in Latin America and you are thinking in a, in a, in a market of more than 550 million people, which uh, are having the second largest growth in, in the world after Asia, we need to really think on what is what we, what we are uh, going to do, especially uh, thinking on also what is happening in the global arena if you think also the importance of uh, uh, the now G20, which at the beginning everybody was talking about the G7, then G7 plus G5. And I do remember while, how the things were changing. Uh, the G5 became suddenly 25% uh, of the GDP of the world, while uh, uh, the G7 was 40%. So you can imagine now with those ideas how the things are changing. Uh, yesterday, actually, I believe is something that uh, something else that we have to put a lot of interest on. Yesterday it was signed by Mexico, uh, with Colombia, uh, Chile, and Peru, and a special uh, new way of doing uh, an integration in the Pacific Arch, which is called uh, Alianza del Pacifico. That means a market of uh, uh, 200 billion people. This means exports of. Uh, uh, for 443 billion US is 51% pretty much of the exports of the whole region of Latin America. Just for you to have this in a, in a perspective, if you compare this 443 billion US of exports with the 281 billions of, uh, billion of exports in the Mercosur, you can imagine also this new idea of getting together and uh, challenging the other parts of, of the Pacific Arch and also around Latin America to have more and more trade 
with the world, but also between us. So what I do believe is that these things are changing, are changing pretty fast, and we definitely need to take advantage of this opportunity that is being presented to Latin America. I believe, I really believe, honestly, that uh, this is the decade of Latin America, and this is a decade of uh, many opportunities if we are able to take uh, uh, advantage of all of this. This is what I will say on that. Bruno, you make a great point in terms of the need to uh, enhance trade and partnerships with the other members uh, in the region, similar to what we're seeing in the Eurozone. Why aren't we seeing more of that? Well, uh, uh, I believe that we have been probably looking into many problems, such as having a real democracy in our countries and also uh, uh, we were looking uh, mostly as uh, it was said also by the president of the Dominican Republic more into uh, 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 into natural goods that we were uh, in, in at that time making a, a, a let's say trade off if uh, if uh, i have to say that uh, for instance mexico was doing trade with the world around 48 uh, uh, billion uh, us at that time Nowadays, our trade is more than 300, I mean, our exports are more than 300 billion US, so you can imagine how fast you can change after having agreements with uh, 44 countries, countries, which is our case. So what I believe is that we need to look more into ourselves, be more proud about what Latin America can do, and of course, take advantage of the young population that we have and about the knowledge that we have. Let's say, for instance, the next, an example of Mexico. Uh, uh, nowadays, we are seeing not just very competitive uh, uh, costs of, uh, of uh, 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 production or, or, let's say, manufacturing costs, but also uh, we need to understand that now generations, generations are changing. Uh, we are graduating probably between uh, uh, around 90,000 90, new engineers or technicians every year on Mexico, which is more than countries such as Germany. And it is uh, quite important to have these people uh, having a new way of uh, earning their lives. And uh, what I'm seeing is that uh, in the past you were seeing these people just making productions of, of uh, uh, let's say, fruits or vegetables. But nowadays, this is people that are working in the designs of uh, the engines of the most advanced planes in the world, or people that is working uh, in the smartphones that you are carrying, or uh, uh, people that are doing many different things that in the past was not an opportunity that Latin America was having. But nowadays, we do have this opportunity, and we have this great opportunity of being uh, uh, the, not just the second, but eventually also the first area of the world that can really uh, uh, grow in the fastest way. Thank you very much, Bruno. And of course, technology has enabled Absolutely. Uh, much of that success. So, Frederico, can you talk to us a bit about uh, that enabling uh, through technology, and of course, which leads us right to innovation, entrepreneurship, and the challenges associated with, with those things, as well as education? Sure. A pleasure. Uh, well, we, we, uh, we must understand innovation in its dimension. To, uh, to, uh, to companies and to economies. Uh, innovation definitely is one of the key ingredients to uh, productivity of, uh, of a company has to be objectively driven at a clear result. Otherwise, we're talking about academy. And uh, as a consequence of that, innovation is also a measure, would say the economists, uh, of, uh, of uh, the competitiveness of a given economy. So uh, we, uh, there's no development without innovation. So with that in mind, uh, we, we must really foster the, the development of policies. And uh, there is a very clear link, in my point of view, between the, any industrial policy and uh, an innovation policy. And uh, with a clear understanding that this is not something which uh, the private sector can expect just the governments to, uh, to be responsible for. There must be a mutual understanding, mutual goal, and mutual investment. So in Brazil, for example, I have the numbers. Uh, we invest you know, uh, less than half percent, less than half in percentage terms than uh, the developed world uh, at government level, even less than that in the private sector. 
So uh, this has to be overcome so if you want to have uh, social development and technological development. But how can we bring this to a, um, to a more collaborative uh, environment? How can we, can that be a, uh, an integration factor you know, throughout the region? I think it can. Uh, if, we, if we think about open innovation, collaborative innovation, where you basically read, you know, you combine and consolidate different uh, expertise, different knowledges into either a product or into a service eventually, uh, that definitely, that goes back to the same idea of wealth of the nations uh, a few centuries ago. And it is true, uh, take uh, our own example, um, an airplane is a very sophisticated machine, but fundamentally uh, the, combi the combination of very sophisticated components as well. And uh, no company in the world has full vertical knowledge of everything. Uh, Petrobras is another great example in deep oil, I mean uh, deep water uh, oil uh, exploitation, uh, where it's a, it's a very real and very impressive example of collaborative innovation where not only them, but uh, many, many of their suppliers are innovating. So can't we find in the region, you know, opportunities for that? Absolutely, I think absolutely we can. Uh, just, just one last point that I'd like to, to comment is that uh, we tend to see innovation always with the eyes of products, of technology. But also, uh, innovation can be related to business models, the way that the company markets uh, something. Uh, we have examples in Brazil, like Natura, it's a very good example of that. And also services. Uh, we, uh, it's the service sector is probably the, the, the sector that uh, drives uh, the highest number of, uh, of, uh, of employment. And uh, definitely, uh, there's a lot to be done there as well and uh, probably with even less investments than, than the industrial sector. So, uh, and I fully agree with Mr. Ferrari. I think uh, it is time, Our this will be the decade of Latin America if we are able to manage it, you know, at our own countries, but also in a collaborative manner. It is doable. I don't think it's simple. There are several, uh, several uh, challenges out there and even some, uh, some threats, if you will. But it, it is doable. It, it, ups, it is up to us to, to take advantage of this uh, window of opportunity. Can you uh, add to the comment about innovation um, being, being seen beyond technology? And you're talking about uh, marketing and a corporate strategy. Where do you find the innovation in, in those things? I can give you maybe uh, one, uh, one example, maybe a couple of examples. Uh, take, for example, the flex, the flex cars in Brazil. The, the, the innovation is not in the engine. I mean, the technology to, to have an ethanol-driven engine has been in Brazil for 30 years. Uh, the innovation was, uh, maybe I should step back and say, well, in the 70s and 80s, Brazil really took the road of ethanol-driven cars, you know. And uh, nine out of ten cars were ethanol-propelled. And then ethanol prices went sky high, and everybody switched to, to gasoline. And nobody would even buy an ethanol car anymore. And uh, so recently, there was this simple idea of, is it possible with, uh, I think, no, no real technological advancement, but is it possible to, by electronics, by simple electronics, to an engine that can cope with whichever fuel at whichever time, so uh, today I'm in the mood of running with ethanol, tomorrow with gasoline, and the day after tomorrow, 50-50. Uh, so this is, a, this, this, is, this idea, as simple as it is, uh, today nine of 10 cars probably sold in Brazil are, are flex. Uh, maybe just a, another example in our case, which is the risk sharing partnership. <clears throat> Instead of us investing in the product, we find other companies in the world that are willing to, to come up to a major airplane program, invest, investing at risk, and sharing the results. It seems, again, very simple, but uh, when we did it for the first time in the early 90s, nobody had done that. And we did that because we had no money to invest, fundamentally. So sometimes uh, the need is, uh, is, uh, helps us to, to be more creative. That's a great point. Disruption often creates change, and sometimes it's actually quite positive. 
That's right. And of course, when we look at innovation, uh, we've seen so much of it in terms of the natural resource space. Uh, we know that the region is rich in natural resources, but Arit Gadesh, you are looking at food, energy production, and the environment, and you say that there is a hidden asset in innovation uh, in that part of the story. Tell us more. Um, let me start with an example. People usually compare oranges to apples when they and listening to the discussions over the past few days, I started to compare oranges from Israel to soybeans from Brazil. Um, and they're very similar in two respects. Both now thrive in places where nature never intended them to be. Um, and both crops are the payoff from what I would call major, bold R&D efforts that created not only the crops themselves, but also a body of intellectual property, or IP as it's called now. And thereby uh, uh, lies the hidden asset. It's how you could exploit intellectual property further. Um, I think the Israeli history is actually instructive. I was born in Israel and grew up there. And when I was young, virtually the only thing that Israel exported was oranges. Today, there's still ox exported, but they're less than uh, a fraction of 1% of what Israel exports. Uh, they're about $22 million. However, those same oranges still contribute greatly to Israel's economy. Uh, the IP that Israel developed in order to create the oranges um, has become now exports at about $2.5 billion uh, worth of water preservation, um, irrigation equipment, services that are related to that. And, uh, and you can find them in almost every arid part of the world. So it's a different way to think about the IP that was developed. I think that a similar outcome is possible to Brazil, which is why I talked about soybeans. In the 1970s, I think it was hard to find a soybean that was actually homegrown here in Brazil. Uh, now Brazil is the number two producer of soybeans in the world and exports about $17 billion of it. And the key, as I was listening around to what everybody was talking about, uh, as I understand it, was again this continuous R&D in seed adaptation and soil uh, correction, which is absolutely fascinates me. Now they're into nanotechnology. Uh, again, IP uniquely developed in Brazil for this purpose. So I think that Brazil's challenge, in this case I talk about Brazil, it's true in other uh, countries, but let me just use Brazil as an example, is to figure out a business model to further exploit that I, the IP that is already developed, just like Israel did in, uh, in water. Uh, now, I think exporting soybeans is great. Exporting even more soybeans with increased productivity is also great, but there's a much bigger opportunity on the table, especially since food scarcity and food prices is really one of the top issues that the world is facing. Um, now, the Israel model here of manufacturing equipment and selling both it and associated services probably doesn't uh, relate to um, soybeans. But what Brazil does need to do is to build a knowledge-based industry that is a business um, plan, if you will, uh, based on its uh, agriculture IP. And I don't have the answer. Should Brazilians be consulting to other countries, a similar soil? Should you become principals? Maybe Brazil can develop a large-scale uh, agriculture industrial uh, industries around the world following the build, operate, transfer that is so common in um, uh, infrastructure. Why not farms, for example? Uh, let me give one other example, though there are many actually that I found in Brazil. Brazil really stands on top of another very important global issue, which is energy. Now, Brazil has developed significant IP on oil and gas sector, and within the next decade, due to the pre-salt uh, discovery, it, it will become one of the top 10 producers, probably sixth or fifth. Um, as I was listening and to what was said and I was reading about it, 
uh, it's clear that the recent discoveries of pre-salt oil were only possible thanks to technology that was perfected in Brazil. Petrobras is already uh, has outstanding IP and probably one of the best when it comes to deep water offshore oil exploration and drilling. Uh, it is also the first to have experimented with drilling of pre-salt um, oil. Now again, the question is how do you exploit this IP, IP further rather than just to create more commodity? Uh, you could further invest in oil rights uh, in areas where sim similar geology, for example. I would guess that in Western Africa, actually, you would find similar geology. Um, if it was left to me, I would actually aggressively work to, attra to attract foreign direct investment, something that Brazil has wor been working against, in a way, uh, from service providers to the oil industry. Uh, to build research centers right here, which will actually add to the IP where Petrobras doesn't have it, but also create a lot of uh, jobs to, in Brazil. Uh, I don't know the answers to, um, to these questions. What I do know is that Brazil can take a broader advantage of its IP than to focus only on the export of com commodities. Uh, IP is not the answer to all the issues, but con uh, consider that uh, Israel's water technologies today are more than a thousand times more valuable than the oranges that they were developed for. Um, and then, <coughs> sorry, consider also that Brazil is sitting, I just mentioned two of the most important issues right now that the world is facing, the scarcity and the prices of energy and food. Uh, I haven't even talked about uh, biofuels, as you mentioned it. Um, the uh, IP that is being developed for other agriculture commodities, forestry, environment, which is just amazing. So altogether, these are assets that could earn Brazil, I think, countless billions of, of reals or dollars or whatever, uh, and really um, generate a lot of very high paying jobs. The one last thing I will say about IP, um, it's fragile. It's, uh, it's kind of like oranges, it has, it has a shelf life. People, it's, it's fleeting unless you keep pressing over an increasing innovation. But other people can see what Brazil is doing and they will strive to copy it. And they will, because the world does not stand uh, still. So looking at this dazzling opportunity to profit from what is already, it's a unique IP that was developed here for, for uh, Brazil and in other countries was developed in Uruguay, I think was for beef, and uh, in um, uh, several other commodities in, in uh, Argentina. But you have to, to decide today on a business model, really a business model, and start planting those business seeds literally today, now. And it's, I think, a huge hidden asset that I use Brazil as an example, but you can find that in quite a number of other Latin American countries. And, and part of the way to do that, you said, is looking at the uh, important resources that are present and capitalize on those, not only by improving facilities in the region, but reaching out to others who are ex uh, expert in that field. Reaching others who are experts in the field and bringing them in to help you and also build more jobs. But actually thinking about this IP not just as a way to increase um, uh, the economy by selling more commodities, but actually owning rights for oil in Africa so that you can actually exploit them when you're down the curve and actually, because uh, there must be pre sold there as well. And what uh, Brazil has perfected is actually the, the identification and the, the interpretation of what is almost impossible to see through the salt. And so that you don't just sell the oil as a commodity, you start planning for the future to use your IP elsewhere, as Israel has done with water. Which is also uh, leading to the issue of a services industry and really deepening your services uh, in the region uh, to really continue to capitalize on that commodity, whatever commodity you're talking about, but the implications of, of that commodity through ongoing services 
Uh, very, very important point there. And, and of course, that creates jobs. Luis uh, Moreno, talk to us about the importance of economic and inclusive growth, particularly as it relates to stability, political stability. This has all sorts of ramifications on the social part of things. I think, um, let me begin by saying, I think President Fernandez painted the picture what I would call the long story and the short story. The long story is that Latin America is very important to take into consideration what happened over the last 20 years. And much of what happened really happened as a result of democracy. If you look back at the polling that many of the firms, there's a specific one in Chile that does polling every year. And it's been doing so for the last 17 years. 17 years ago, Latin Americans thought there was no difference if one had a democratic government or a military government. This, the changes from there to today, where the number one issue for Latin Americans is not employment, which would be probably any Western country's number one issue. The number one issue is crime. But as President Fernandez set it out, the fundamental problem is how we can quickly close many of the gaps. And it's a set of challenges that Latin America has not had the opportunity to face in the past because we were sunk in so many financial crises over the years. In a space of 25 years, we had almost 31 financial crises. So it's almost like a reversal of the agenda. When you look at, as President Fernandez was describing, the set of complexities countries like the United States and Europe have to deal just with dealing with the crisis itself, our possibilities are precisely to reduce much of the space we've had in the past. What does that mean in terms of inclusive growth? I think over the last decade or so, Latin America has experimented tremendously in ways to close some of these gaps. A very good example is a program here in Brazil that really started in Mexico, which is called Bolsa Familia, which basically begins by a concept of giving a child truly a second opportunity and saying to that mother, who perhaps that child had been going and working in, uh, a, in some form of, of child labor, and say, no, you go to school, but when you go to school, you make sure you take a test uh, on your health and that we can check that you're going to school. And I think that has allowed, in Brazil alone, over the last uh, eight years, to get almost 30 million people out of, of poverty. And that growth in the middle classes, not Western-type middle classes, but the, the, the emergence of middle classes is changing tremendously, not only the appetite and the need for goods and the ways of how we address it. And here are some of the things that Ori was mentioning and the other panelists regarding technology, uh, regarding the ways uh, that we look at education. You know, education is a long journey, but some countries have managed to do advances very quickly. If you look at the OECD scores, for instance, uh, which are done on 15-year-olds, even though there's been tremendous progress in Latin America, we're still very much down. And that is something that we need to improve. Productivity is at the center of everything that we need to do in the future, and this is where technology plays a tremendously important role. And how you combine that with labor markets. Today, most of our labor still is, at least on average, perhaps anywhere from 40 to 50 percent, is in the informal sectors. We gotta change the incentives to bring people more into the formal sectors of the economy. So these are the set of challenges combined with the real opportunities that present themselves you know, when you sit back here and think, well, 50 years ago, John Kennedy launched the Alliance of Progress. Latin America looked north. But what's interesting is the true north of Latin America we're finding as we look south, as we look among ourselves, as we have more assertiveness in the future that we can build. So I would say these are some of the issues that are going to be there on the agenda, and this is why we truly believe that this is the decade of the opportunity for Latin America. You make wonderful points because empowering people, empowering children, <coughs> leads to education as well as happiness. And when you are happy and feel empowered, you want to do well. You don't want to see crime. You want goodness for your family, your community, and the constituents. No question. And, 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 uh this is one happy hemisphere, let me tell you. Yes, and you are yeah. in one happy city. Um, <laughs> and, and the, you know, the, we did actually a study at the bank uh, precisely about this very issue, about the quality of life. And it's interesting that people 
uh, it is when people uh, have less access to things that in an odd way they feel happier. But as, as you have a more, uh, your set of ambitions grow, so do uh, your happiness levels change. And what we will see is higher demands on our political system, higher demands on the way we operate, in, in, in our, the way our businesses operate. And here is you know, a lot of innovation that has been done in social entrepreneurs. You know, a lot is talked about that. We looked at great lessons that have happened, say, in India. But there's a tremendous amount of development in social entrepreneurship, which is another element that I think is as important. It's a great point. And of course, uh, Vikram Pandit, all of this leads toward financial uh, independence. And you're looking at achieving financial inclusion. How do you do it? Maria, we had a very uh, interesting panel earlier today uh, on financial inclusion. We had uh, participants from uh, Bolivia, from Mexico, Brazil, others, and uh, we talked a lot about this. And uh, let me talk about the scale, and this is um, a global issue, 2.5 billion people unbanked. By some measures, as many as 4 billion out of 6.5 billion people unbanked. This is a big uh, issue for, uh, for on a financial inclusion basis and on a conservative basis you're looking at about 60 percent of Latin America unbanked as well. Let's talk about scope. Most people think about financial inclusion as making loans available, micro loans, micro lending to individuals who need, um, who need credit and yes that's part of it, microfinance is, but it's payments, it's uh, moving you know, receiving money into some account is an important thing, or just savings, and savings are really important to an economic, uh, to the economic identity of individuals, and creates uh, empowerment in a in a different way, leads to communities that are stronger. Really, it's all about economic inclusion. Lots of efforts going on um, on this around the world. It's um, it's an entrepreneurial area. Banks doing things, individuals doing things. But here's the thing, even the most organized of the efforts, which is microfinance around the world, so far has only reached about 150 million people out of the 2.5 to 4 billion unbanked. So the real challenge is scale. And how do you scale this to bring people into the financial system? And, and, and you've got to get the foundations right. I think technology is going to help. Nine out of 10 people in Latin America have a cell phone, but only four out of 10 have a bank account. So the phones have something to do with it, and, and by the way, they're going to therefore increase the reach, lower the cost. Um, uh, that's foundational. Uh, you got to get regulation right. Regulation is not set up for the unbanked. As a matter of fact, most of the banking system, which has to reflect the regulation, is not geared to help the unbanked. Think simple things like know your clients. I mean, this is an important thing. You know, you don't want to be funding and financing criminals and terrorists but costs about $70 an account to get that right in many parts of the world. There are ways of dealing with that. You've got to get financial education right, which starts with kindergarten. It's, uh, you know, it's, and we do a lot of that at City, helping financial education, but, but it's a, uh, managing finances is a critical part of financial education. Now, of course, none of this is going to happen without public-private partnerships. Um, now, we're working with the IADB here um, on a pilot project, and we're going to involve about 14 financial institutions. The goal is to create savings accounts, teach people how to save, have them build assets, uh, and you know, even as ambitious as that is, we're only going to reach about 150,000 people over the next three years. So, a um, uh, lot of work has to get going on this, but it does uh, require a broader public perspective to create the foundations if we want to build scale. Um, let, me, let me make uh, uh, my last point, which is uh, um, uh, growth can create a lot of wonderful things for all kinds of inclusion. And, uh, and over the last um, uh, few days, I've, I've spent a week here. I started in Argentina, made my way up to Rio slowly, and uh, met a lot of clients, uh, about 75, 80, both private and public sector uh, clients. And first of all, let me say, um, it, it, the, the amount of talent and the entrepreneurship and the business acumen is impressive. I mean, it's world class. Um, and it's really going to be the backbone of growth for Latin America. But the projects they have in mind are impressive. They are world scale. I and mean, if you really just take a look at something like Presol, which is the oil field that already talked about that's offshore, I mean, it's going to take 
$400 billion over the next four years to do anything with that. And you add up all the investments, public and private, you're easily over a trillion and a half dollars in investments over the next 10 years. Um, and you don't invest that kind of money without creating growth, and hopefully all this starts working. It creates jobs, it creates middle class, it creates economic inclusion, perhaps it creates the resources to create the foundation for this inclusion. It's a great, great uh, insights, Vikram. Thank you for that. And, and, and while we are looking to achieve all of these goals, there are major catalysts on the horizon for the region. And Sir Martin Sorrell is looking at sports events branding opportunities to the region, which of course will bring capital into the region uh, from all over the world. Martin. I, th I think you're pressed for time. I saw Robert Greenhill sort of uh, well, nudging you Well, some of the so people on the panel, unfortunately, do have a okay. to catch a flight. Okay. I'm um, trying to so make it as interactive uh, well, as I'll I try could, and be. But, uh, I know it's not my usual habit, but I will try and be <laughs> as brief as possible. Um, I, I, you asked about the, the importance of events, uh, Maria, and um, I, I just, I actually emailed somebody. Somebody, you may have seen I was playing with my Blackberry. That wasn't bad manners. It was a, it was a definitive purpose. And I just asked, asked um, we do country branding and we look at country attributes. And, I, and, I, and I, I said, what are the attributes of Latin America? Because this is about Latin America, although we focused a lot on, on Brazil. And uh, so we, we look at Argentina, Colombia, Brazil. But there's some interesting uh, words that keep this. This is people's perceptions outside the countries of uh, countries. So this can be from uh, Asia, from Europe, uh, from Africa, and Middle East. Uh, sensuous, kind, friendly, energetic, fun, social. The word sensuous comes up quite a bit, actually. But those are. <laughs> Those are some of the, the attributes, the attributes that are attributed to Latin America. And there are two things I want to focus on in relation to events. What I would call hardware and software, and we've heard of already from the other panelists comments on hardware and software. When you think about events, they have, it's really interesting, they have political, social, and economic consequences. I mean, the political consequences, for example, none of you know about cricket, but in, in, in India, when India played Pakistan in the, the, World, the World Cup a few weeks ago, the Indian Prime Minister contacted the Pakistan president and said, come and watch the game. And that initiated political moves. Maybe they will be unsuccessful, we'll see. But initiated political moves. These events, these sporting events, have very powerful political consequences. They have powerful social consequences to do today. I mean, when we in our preparatory session, Maria said, we'll never mention the, the wedding this morning, but here goes. <laughs> when, 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 you, when you look at the wedding this morning, what has that done within minutes, within hours, not even a day? It's changed the perception, I would argue, already of the UK monarchy and has, has had a very positive stimulative effect to the, to the extent that Breaking Views, a respected economic uh, commentary service, suggest, suggested this afternoon that it might have, uh, the wedding might have a significant business effect on the UK, and that America needs a royal wedding to get them out of the, <laughs> out of the, doldrums, out of the doldrums as well. The third, thing, the third thing is an economic effect about the positioning of countries. And again, we had a very interesting uh, session with Ronaldo, and I'll come back to him in a second, and, and, and Luis, uh, on sport and events in the context of Brazil and Rio. And we went back to Barcelona because we had the, the president of the Barcelona Foundation. And we went back to Spain and Barcelona in 1992, and Sevilla, the World Fair in Spain. That, I would argue, repositioned a post-Franco Spain in a very significant way, both the World Expo and the Barcelona Olympics. It had an impact on China. Nobody who saw the opening or closing ceremony in Beijing will ever think about China in a different way. It has an, had an impact on South Africa. Nobody, I would argue, will think about the continent of Africa in a different way now, following the very successful World Cup uh, in FIFA World Cup in South Africa. And remember, people said, it was going to be extremely difficult to do. Delays in stadiums sounds familiar, doesn't it, in terms of what's going on. So that's the background. Now, just four quick points. What do these events do? They escalate infrastructure investment. I don't think 
they actually increase infrastructure investment. It eventually comes to growth economies, but it escalates. And we've already seen that, uh, with all due respect, in the context of Brazil. The president announces that the privatization uh, of, uh, or program for the privatization, privatization of airport, airports. Uh, and we all know, having traveled uh, from Sao Paulo to Rio, or vice versa, how difficult that is. So you get faster development, and at the same time, you get very significant repositioning uh, of the country in the form of tourism and the, genera the generation of trade and tourism. The second point is about what happens to the flows of, of business both into the country and out of the country. What you see is very extent. Now, if you go back to China for a minute, no self-respecting Chinese company missed out on the opportunity of repositioning its brand and its company in the context of the Beijing Olympic Games. No self-respecting multinational company missed out on the opportunity of positioning themselves in China in the same way. So you get two ways. So in the context of Brazil, we have Embraer uh, on, the, on the panel. It's an extremely good example, but Ambev obviously would be another. Vale would be another. Petrobras would be another. These are Brazilian brands that, that will become not just Latin American brands, but worldwide brands as, as well. Now, now let me just move to the software very quickly. The third thing that happens is that role models, and I mentioned we were with uh, the phenomenon uh, Ronaldo, role models play a very important part in, sti in, st in, a st in stimulating a psychological effect, and I would argue an entrepreneurial effect, an effect in, of lifting people out, at least mentally, out of poverty and giving them examples to follow. And I think that's extremely powerful in the context of these events and has an impact in terms of helping in social moves, corporate social responsibility, uh, and poverty as well. And the last point is, is, it also sounds an ephemeral point, but extremely important. These events focus the passion, the spirit, the pride, and enthusiasm of the people. I mean, I, again, I'll go back to the wedding. Uh, the, one of the, the commentators said, it makes you really proud to be British when you see the way this is executed. The same thing applies to the South Africans' attitude to the Olympic Games, to the Chinese, the pride that they had in, in, the, in those ceremonies, which were extremely powerful. And I predict it will be the same in the context of Brazil. So the, the, the impact on the happiness index that Luis referred to, this is in this, one, in this wonderful city of Rio, in this wonderful country of Brazil, in this wonderful content of La continent of Latin America, it's extremely powerful and don't underestimate it. Now, having said that, just one word of warning. And I don't want to finish on a downer, but I just make this point. The two big events that Maria refers to are the Olympics and the, the World Cup. They are occurring in Brazil. Uh, in our case at WPP, of our $1.3 billion of revenue, $650 million occurs in this, in this wonderful country of Brazil. There are other countries in Latin America. Mexico, I think, gets a raw deal uh, from the media, which we have heavy contact with. And when you look at what, you know, there are two Mexicos. There's a Mexico that gets played, and we've referred to crime, and we haven't referred to drugs, et cetera, and drug trade but gets referred to in the media because it's a sensationalist story. There are wonderful things going on in Mexico in terms of the environment, in terms of private uh, entrepreneurship, in terms of private-public partnerships that don't see the light of day. So there's Mexico. There's Argentina, which despite the challenges it had in 2002, has made an incredible recovery, driven by commodity, food price, inflation, and uh, around the changes in food price habits. There is Colombia, which under President Uribe, and now under President Santos, has made a miraculous change uh, in its economy uh, and, and the way that it has dealt with terrorism uh, and the narco trade. And there last but not least, there are countries like Chile with tremendous stability uh, and prospect. And I would just finally, finally mention, I was in Uruguay for the first time. I had a really interesting conversation with ourselves about a very tiny economy a three million people economy in the context of Latin America, it's 550 million, 600 million people. Uruguay is one of the, the best wired countries. It's a Singapore of Latin America, as I would, sandwiched between Brazil and Argentina. And we talked about Paraguay, a very fast, rapidly growing economy, one of the fastest growing economies in Latin America, 
if not in the world, with just 10 million people, strong commodity base, agricultural land. There are very powerful countries beyond Brazil, and it's very important that it is an inclusive process as well as a process focused on Brazil. Martin, really valuable points on, on all fronts. So in terms of achieving the goals that we have set forth, we need to, number one, ensure that goods and services activity is happening throughout the region. Uh, that means uh, look at the template in Europe, for example, and make sure trade and activity is going on throughout the Latin American region. Develop policies on innovation. Um, and look at innovation and technology not only in the traditional sense necessarily just technology but look for innovation through the corporate strategy uh, through the way the the region is marketed exploit intellectual property uh, creating services capitalizing on the strength of the region currently and create a services industry around that Make sure to target your biggest issues, uh, one of which being crime, of course, to empower people so that we can have financial inclusion and create uh, a better banking situation so that people are empowered and uh, are happier and are taking care of their family. And finally, really capitalize on uh, the events that are on the horizon uh, in terms of infrastructure build, but not only traditional um, ways like infrastructure builds, but also around role models and showing off the great brands that are Latin America and be proud uh, to be Latin American. I want to thank our wonderful panel and thank the uh, audience for your patience today. Uh, and at this time, I would ask Marisol Argueta to be uh, joining us on stage so that she can officially close the summit with Bruno Ferrari. Thanks, everyone. I would like to thank all of our participants and our very distinguished co-chairs for this wonderful meeting. It's been a very successful starting of a decade. So thank you very, very much. And I would like to invite you all to join us next year in Mexico. With us, the Secretary of Economy of Mexico, Bruno Ferrari. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marisol. Of course, for us, it will be a pleasure to have this wonderful uh, meeting now in Mexico. Uh, last time was in Cancun a couple of years ago. And uh, be sure that you will have uh, a happy uh, uh, continent working together, not just on enjoying ourselves, but especially on focusing ourselves on what are the challenges and, of course, in how we can solve and take advantage of this great opportunity for Latin America. See you there. Thank you very much.